All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just before we start, because we've got members of the public here, I need to um, um, tell you about the opportunity to take this opportunity to advise you that in the event of emergency alarm sounding, and we're not expecting one, there's no... Uh, no f alarms for training purposes or anything. Um, we should ha leave the building using the nearest available emergency exit as directed and assemble at the car park opposite Bedford College main entrance, which is to the left from Borough Hall until we receive further instructions. Anyone unable to leave the building should temporarily remain in the designated refuge um, while awaiting assistance to move to safety. The nearest refuge is located through the door at the rear of Committee Room 1. And for people who don't know where Committee Room 1 is, it's the next committee room, so you'd go out there and turn to the right. And it's at the top, um, and the door, the rear door is, is, is obvious with a, a sign above it. And is, you assemble at the top of the steps leading down to the outside of the building. Okay, let's hope we don't need to use it. Okay, so <clears throat> if we move then um, to agenda item one on today's meeting, and that's to consider any questions um, from members of the public. And I think we've got several questions, but we've only got one member of the public here. Okay. Is that right? Um, would you like to um, tell us what your question is, please? No, no, you can sit down, but you need to put, you need to put your microphone on and, and, and just to speak as close to it as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's a question to the committee rather than an officer. Could you be a bit more specific? Because, I mean, certainly as a chair, I've only had this question about an hour ago. Um, so, you know, I haven't been able to do much uh, investigation on this one at all. Um, could you be more specific? Do you mean any particular road? Do you mean the roads? Do you mean the railway? Do you, could, because obviously... Um, the railway is the responsibility, they are the responsibility of the railway authorities. Uh -huh. I appreciate that. So um, the context of it is bringing it back to... We, we are not the health authority, the health committee, we're actually the environment committee, which is slightly different. I mean, it, it, I mean, we can't, I'm, I'm not quite sure, do you want the whole lot? I mean, because I, I don't know. I mean, I'm really happy with what you're willing to share, because, because it is an environment question in the sense that it's... keep turning alts on again. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> um, our environment is heavily impacted by, I feel like I'm shouting now, by the construction of railway. So it feels to us, certainly as residents of poets, that um, in the full council meeting that was in February 21, which was talk, a debate about railways, there was an impression given by active contributions and non-participation that the existing railway lines have no impact on residents. Now, 
we as neighbouring residents don't feel this. So it, it, the council kind of gave us an impression from the meeting that the railway line is nuisance free. But as local residents, having been through all the piling and everything that's gone on in the recent years, we know that it's not nuisance free. So it feels to us that we're not convinced, if you like, that the council are concerned with the residents and the environmental impact of building a railway. Okay, thank you. Well, it's, a, it's quite a complicated question and it's a long uh, question and I think the best thing to do is to make some investigations and give you a written answer. I don't think we can go into the debate here on, okay. you know, the shortness of the, the question, the short notice of the question. Okay. okay, that would be absolutely perfect. Do you know when I could expect to reply by? Just so I can tell the team. Uh, I'm sorry, I won't be right in the corner. <laughs> sorry, I don't know. Um, we, we should be within, we should be Within the week. Yeah. All right, absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we, if we can't, we'll let you know for the reasons if there is quite a bit of information. All right, lovely. Okay. Thank you. But thank you very much for coming to the meeting and thank you for asking the question and taking the time to do that. So it is appreciated, people who participate. So thank, thank you and hopefully you'll get a, 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 more full, a fuller reply. Perfect, thanks. So, thank you very much. Um, we've got some more questions as well, um, and they, people haven't turned up. Um, can you read them out, Jeremy, please? Uh, yes, we had a question that said, the first one was, when will your next air quality, air pollution data be published, please, and where can this information be found once it's published? Right, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, can one of the officers do it, Matthew? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite it's quite lengthy, isn't it? I mean, I've got, I've got that as well. Yeah. Uh, the response back was quite short. Oh right, okay. Oh, that one. Yeah, sorry, I was thinking of the second question. You can read it out. Okay. Um, there is a prepared answer to that question, and the answer is that the next air quality annual status report is in the final stages of review prior to submission to DEFRA by the end of July 2022. And once that report has been reviewed by DEFRA and feedback received, it will be published on our website at, um, there's a link there, Air Quality at Bedford Borough Council. That, I'll make sure that link is published within, within minutes. Um, previous reports, including the 2021 report, are already available on those pages. And if anyone is looking for that link, it's Air Quality Bedford Borough Council. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. And then she had a second question, didn't she? Uh, yes, the second question, um, completely different. Please, could you provide an update on the school streets programme? It would be really interesting to hear how this is going and what the next steps are. Yeah, and this is a, a lengthy, a lengthy uh, prepared reply. Um, I, I mean, the lady's not here at the moment. Do you just want to speak briefly to it? Yeah, there's, there's a, a longer response, or a slightly longer response, that gives some sort of quantitative and qualitative feedback from the three school streets that are underway. But I think to, to, to Pracy, it's been successful across the piece. I think we've seen an increase in walking and cycling, we've seen a decrease in uh, people driving or dropping kids at school. We've seen, a, a, from a, that qualitative piece, we've certainly seen people pleased with the environment in and around schools and the implementation of school streets. So I think we will continue with the three that are underway, the three that are, uh, that are very much in a trial uh, status at the moment, but I think it will be, the anticipation is, that this will become a, a regular part of our programme on an annual basis, these school streets, and they will become regular features across our schools in the borough. <laughs> I'm so conscious of uh, on and off, I forgot, sorry. Um, I'd, um, what I said is we will um, give a written response to the lady that asked both those questions on the air quality control and also on the school streets. And thank you very much. 
Okay. Um, are there any are there any questions from members of, of the council committee? No, I'm sorry, I've got that. yeah, Councillor Blair. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is for officers. Um, like many councillors, I guess, I get many calls from residents regarding areas of dense weeds, uh, curbside and road gutters. Uh, and there, I'm often asked, is there a programme, a repeat programme, uh, to clear these? And is this delivered by highways or some other medium or contractors? Or There is a programme. There is a, a, a weed clearance and a weed killing programme. And I suppose it, there's a split between highways weeds and amenity area weeds. So, yeah, there is a split between the two. But we do have an external contractor that does our highway weeds, yeah, and we are having conversations, I suppose, lately, uh, due to the, uh, the British weather, plenty of rain and plenty of sun, uh, as the saying goes, they grow like weeds. Grows like weeds. So it, it, it is something we do, we are on top of. It is something we get an awful lot of feedback, and again, people can certainly go onto the website through the report it function, but we do have cyclical programmes of, of weed treatment and weed killing, but yeah, the, 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 the British weather doesn't really help us when it comes to the... Uh, the, the growth of some of these weeds. Any other questions from members? Okay, fine, thank you. Um, item two then is to receive any apologies. I think we've got some already, haven't we? Any apologies? Thank you for coming. Um, I believe we've received apologies from councillors Abbott and Hill. <laughs> I can't see very well, and I thought, <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I'm at the hill. I know you said you were one man band, and you're obviously doing the work of three over there, yeah. Okay, okay, um, thank you for that. Um, item three is the previous minutes, it's to confirm the minutes of the meeting from the 9th of June. Uh, is it your wish that I sign them as a correct copy? Thank you, Fred. Yeah. Thank you. Um, item four, um, disclosure of uh, local and disposable pecuniary interests. And if they've got anything they need to declare about items on the agenda today. No? Thank you. Right, then we go to the overview part of the uh, committee, the, the meat in the sandwich, so to speak. Um, item five, which is a civil enforcement powers for moving traffic um, violations. Yeah? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I wasn't anticipating going line by line through the, the document, but hopefully it gives a, a decent overview of the moving traffic enforcement powers that we applied for and we were actually successful. One of the first authorities in the country, there were seven, I think there was in the eastern region that were applied for these powers and were successful for these powers. So we're just working through the uh, application of those powers now. We've had two or three iterations of the guidance already from central government. It's, it's a slight moving feast at the moment, exactly what we can and what we can't do. But we're working for the guidance at the moment and we're looking at some appropriate sites where we might like to introduce the, um, these powers or introduce some of this equipment really that deals with sort of safety issues, congestion issues, air quality issues, etc., etc., etc. And hopefully there's a, uh, there's a decent breakdown at the back of the document in terms of the exact uh, contraventions that we can enforce now with these new powers. So it's... Uh, it's, it's been a long time coming. It's been something that's been under discussion for at least five to ten years that I've been aware of these powers that they've been under discussion that the government were going to bestow these to um, other local authorities. But, yeah, I think it would be a really useful addition to our, 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 our approaches to really trying to keep our network as safe and as uh, congestion-free and, 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 uh, as possible. So happy to take any questions on the document. Sorry, Councillor Atty. <laughs> um, I've got a question for the book. One uh, is that they say they have a hot spot right here uh, um, where they might um, spot this camera or no. Yes. And second is like they're going to be fine. Uh, I know the part 
some sort of with the power now. So where's the money going to go? Are they going to go to central government or are they going to come to the government? No, no, no. We're twofold. In terms of hot spots, yeah, we have a we have an idea currently of where we feel there are issues on the network, congestion issues, safety issues, again, air quality issues, where we feel we will certainly look into the viability of introducing this equipment or introducing these powers to try and help in those areas. So in terms of hotspots, secondly, in terms of the fines, yes, we as the borough will keep the fines. We have no say over the, the level of the fines. They're set centrally and, and nationally, but we will keep all, all revenue from the fines, yes. Um, is there any spot oh, really? Sorry, turn it off. Sorry, um, is there any spot in uh, Colwell Board because uh, we have a lot of complaint on Victoria Road turning right from Kempston Road and, and uh, people are complaining from like last 10 years. So is that on the list? Sorry, I've, I've been bit. <laughs> For, because this is our board, sorry. No, I mean, I will certainly give you feedback as to what we think our, our, our first pass is and where some of these locations are. Yeah, so we Councillor Coombs. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the, the report, Matthew. Um, I did discuss this with Wixom Parish Council uh, when you were doing the consultation, and I, I did tell them I supported it and asked them to uh, also support the, the idea as well. Um, one of the things that came back from that discussion was that the Parish Council said it's all very well having these powers, but how are you going to enforce them? And I think that's the, the crux of the matter because, you, you know, we know that these uh, violations seem to be going on all across the borough. You know, Councillor Atik has mentioned her ward. I, I, can, I can fight you for Wixom, you know, and say, no, actually, it's worse down where we are. And I'm sure other councillors can, can give horror stories in their own wards. So how, um, how are you actually going to ensure that you have enough people to enforce these uh, these new powers that you have. And secondly, in the long list of things, some of which are a little bit obscure um, in terms of the different regulations, does it include cars parking across somebody's driveway and blocking their exit from their own house? On that, I'm 99% certain that would be where it's to do with construction. Too loud, I've been turning the microphone off. Um, where it causes an obstruction, that's actually a police matter rather than a civil matter. If somebody's parking across your drive, that's a, we've, we've had this conversation before. So anything that causes nuisance or a, a safety issue is actually a police matter rather than a civil enforcement matter. But in terms of um, existing numbers, it, the, the intention is that the vast majority of these would be picked up via camera enforcement, band right turns, uh, bus lanes, as we do with so elements such as that. But no, our... our our civil enforcement officers will have similar powers to go out. I think it would be a case of, as we do, we, we look at our resources, we look at the hotspots, and we sort of calibrate and validate the amount of resources we've got compared to the uh, level of contraventions that are going on ground. So it will be something we will certainly keep under review, but the, the plan is that we will capture the majority of these contraventions via camera enforcement rather than sort of um, individual enforcement. But again, we will certainly keep it under review. I was I, that's that's exactly what I thought. Yeah, I was. I, I've actually got some questions myself on this, and I've got some reservations. I'm not against it because um, any extra powers that there are, I think, is a, is a good idea. But um, I, it's interesting the question that Councillor Coombs asked because I, I, the questions I've got is about pavement parking um, and. I'm a little bit concerned if we're going to be reliant on cameras, which we've got to buy, that's about, what's it, quite a lot of money each time, and then all of us are going to be fighting to have them in our areas to, to get these things. And the public, are, if, they, if they think we've got these powers, they will expect things to happen. Um, and I, um, I, I think it's... There's a lot of gaps in this, quite frankly, to be honest. I mean, it's, uh, it's OK having cameras, but people want someone to come along and move the car away or, or tell, them, tell them off, you know. It's a, 
you can't leave a car for ages on a on a cycle track. It's parked on a cycle track. Um, and the, um, we don't have the powers to physically move people's vehicles in any case. I realise that. I was probably exaggerating. I hope you'd know what I meant. But, I mean, the thing is, at the moment, that the, the police are saying, you know, they're far too busy to, to, to do all these things and to do with pavements. Um, and anyway, it's going to the council, isn't it? Um, but the point is, in reality, we're not going to have people walking up and down Kempston High Street looking for people that are parked on pavements. But then only this week, we've had a, a town council meeting, a member of public come in really quite cross because there were um, cars parked on the pavement and things. And I've had people complaining about cars on cycle tracks. And yet, all of these criteria, loads of these criteria in here make reference to cycle tracks and pedestrianised um, walking areas and things. It, 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 I, I think it's... Uh, um, I, don't, I don't see how it can happen if, if we're not going to do anything extra. We're not having any extra people or anything like that. And we're going to rely on fines to buy all these cameras to have in all these places. And I'm not quite sure how these places are going to be chosen and by whom? Um, um, Matthew, could you make sure your microphone's on because otherwise anybody watching this later on in the video won't be able to hear a word you're saying. Thank you. Back to the point, I think as, as these are new powers, we are still quite early in the piece and I think it's now uh, incumbent on the service area to go away and see what is the best use of these powers, the best application of these powers, is it through the use of the camera equipment, is it through the use of better deployment or greater deployment for our CEOs, as we say, the, it, so far the, the, the guidance is a slightly moving feast, it, it's, it's, it's understanding what the powers are and what is the best use of those, but I absolutely take your point about it, it will boil down to enforcement, it's having the powers and it's how we do enforce those powers, so yeah, it's, we will have to go away as a service area and look at that, but as I say, we're certainly happy to take guidance and input from members and members of the public as to where they feel some of these issues, these perennial issues are uh, and we can go away and maybe come up with an enforcement plan that, 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 that can deal with that. So how, what, what's the time span? What's the, what can we expect? Well we need to, again whilst we've been given the unofficial, we've seen it and we had to go digging on a, a government website to see that we've been bestowed with the powers. We haven't actually had the formal letter from central government just yet to say that we've actually got the powers. As I say, we, we saw this second hand from interrogating the website. So it will be a case of understanding where the powers are and understanding where we begin to apply these powers. But we, we'd like to think that certainly this year that we'd like to get some of this equipment out or even as our CEOs can start to apply these powers. We've done the work on the TROs. All of our TROs are now in place that we can enforce movie tra traffic enforcement. So from a from a, a legislation and from a TRO point of view already. So, yeah, it's just as soon as we are formally given the powers then we can start to enforce. Thank you. So, so uh, where it says, and powers were granted in June 2022, it's not quite, because we haven't actually had the letter, that's not strictly true. No. We, we, as we said, we, had to, we, we found that out second hand, but, yeah, the formal letter to tell us we've got those, we need to chase that. Thank you. And can I, uh, a final question for me, I mean, um, you're talking about getting, getting this equipment out, etc, etc. How much of this equipment have we got? We have an existing, because we already enforce our um, bus lanes, we have an existing framework arrangement with the supplier, so the supplier of this equipment... <coughs> Sorry, I can't So we, we have an existing framework agreement for the supply of moving traffic enforcement cameras. Obviously, we have our average speed cameras and we have our um, cameras that enforce our bus lanes. So we, we have arrangements in place to be able to call off this equipment. Yeah, yeah but how many, have, how many have we got? So we, we're going to be robbing Peter to pay Paul, are we? No, no, no. I mean, we, we have access. We have a route to market to procure this equipment. OK, all right. Are there any further questions? I'm, yeah, Councillor Weir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Matt, uh, uh, the civil enforcement 
powers for moving traffic violations, which is something new completely, isn't it? In terms of enforcement of what Chair was talking about in uh, parking and parking across cycleways, I get lots of issues about this, and it, it, is it um, a nuisance or is it breaking the law? And, and I don't know quite where our enforcement teams see that area. To, to, the, to the application of the law, pavement parking, unless there is special legislation put in for that area of pavement, then it is more nuisance than an offence. Where we have no verge parking or, 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 or TROs or, or appropriate orders to that fact, then we can enforce. Where there are those powers in place, then we can enforce. But generally, yes, it is, unfortunately, it is more of a nuisance than a, a something that we can enforce against. But certainly from a, a safety point of view, I've had children myself trying to push, push chairs along paths with, with people double parked and people in wheelchairs. As you say, whilst it is seen as a, it, it is a real problem. If I, if I can just um, address that too. In, in, in a ward that there's a lot of there's a lot of dense housing, it becomes even more of a problem uh, with cycle lanes and curb parking. Uh, and in part of the ward, we have installed um, no curb parking. We've got the, the rules in. It doesn't always work, <laughs> but uh, then it's, it's about enforcement again and about making sure that the, we constantly report it. Um, but I, I do agree with the chair that we do, if we're going down this road of moving vehicle enforcement, moving traffic enforcement, I think we need to really tighten up on the, the non-moving traffic so that we, we don't cause issues on cycle lanes, etc. Okay, could be all night. I could uh, write a book on it. Um, anyway, uh, are there any other questions on this item? Uh, Chair, could, Chair could, I, could I just make a recommendation or request that Perhaps Matthew can come back in six months with a with a plan when he's got the when he's got the official letter rather than just finding it out from a website. Um, if he could come back with a plan of how he's actually going to roll this out, where there might be pilot schemes, what budget he's got, and hopefully he'll have a lot more information when we could look at this particular issue again. I, I quite agree. I think there, we've got lots of questions between us. As we, as we're all experiencing the problems, um, some of us personally and some of, them, some of it through our residents. Um, I, I think that would be useful, but I don't really, I don't want it to come here, you know, like shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted, so to speak. It's all in place and everything, and then we haven't... It, it hasn't Perhaps within... With as soon as, sorry, Chair. I was going to say, as soon as Matthew's got a report ready yeah. and it's ready to go, he could, he could bring it here and we can take a look at it. I don't know how long it will take, but you know, we're not going to have another meeting until September. So we might be able to do something I'll there. I'll certainly come back for September. Bloody button. I can, certainly come, <laughs> I can certainly come back for September with a bit of a timeline to the work we've done between then and now and then what that timeline and what some of those milestones might be after that. I, I don't think that would be too overly onerous. Thank you. I think you can see that it's of great interest to quite a few people, so, um, well, mo almost all of us. So, so thank you very much for that. So we'll, we can then move on to the next item. Thank you, Matthew. I keep forgetting to do that. Um, move on to the next item, which is item six, which is the impact of the current shortages on environment services. I think um, it's a kind of you know, rerun of what we've all, not a rerun, but a continuation, I should say, of uh, what we've heard before. But thank, thank you. So um, can you introduce the report, please? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, we'll get it sorted next time. I'm going to operate Matthew's uh, microphone. He can operate <laughs> mine. So we'll get, we'll get the act together next time. Um, yeah, ju just going on from what you said there, Chair, um, it is a continuing theme. Um, you know, obviously from our point of view, it's been a very challenging number of years that we've faced um, delivering frontline services right across the area. And, and that, this is a joint report from Matthew and me, really. Um, we've, we've obviously had the issues with the COVID. We've had the issues with the uh, number of EU drivers going back. Um, obviously, that's caused problems with the, uh, the HGV shortage across the UK. Um, we've got a number of... Uh, 
a huge amount of drivers retiring and not the uh, younger generation coming into them roles. So, you know, there's various figures being thrown around over the last couple of years to say that uh, the shortage has been impacted by at least, you know, 60 to 80 to 100,000 drivers across the UK. Everybody thinks that it impacts across the sort of the logistic range, so delivering goods to shops and things like that. Um, quite clearly, it's far reaching in all sectors, and that includes the council as well. So certainly between mine and Matthew's area, um, we employ a significant number of HGV drivers. Um, quite clearly, some of them are you know, very easy to identify, such as the refuse collection service, um, come and collect your wheel bins. Um, the drivers all have to be uh, HGV uh, qualified to drive that type of vehicle. Um, but that also goes to our clinical waste collections, because we collect clinical waste. Um, and we also deliver bins and collect commercial collections of bulky waste and stuff like that as well. So it does impact quite a wide uh, area um, that uh, obviously is important to the public. Um, from our point of view, it, it has been challenging. Um, you, you've seen the likes of other councils up and down the UK and even some of our neighbouring councils um, shut down collections for, for not weeks but many months um, you know, in one go. Um, whilst we, we, we've, we've struggled to recruit, we've struggled to retain drivers, there's a lot of movement in that sector. Um, you know, we've done some benchmarking to make sure that we're trying to attract the right uh, calibre of people to our roles. Um, that being said, we can't compete with some of the logistical companies where they're paying, you know, £60,000 um, for a similar driver. Um, it does vary quite a bit because obviously our drivers come in the morning and go home. Um, some of them higher rates are paid for drivers where they're working away and sleeping in cabs and things like that. However, it is a significant uh, challenge for us to retain our staff. We've done a pretty good job up to now. Um, a lot of it is a bit like a duck on a lake. You know, you see the service going around the streets and it all looks quite sensible and you get your bins collected but underneath the feet are going quite quickly um, so you know we've had supervisory uh, driving our refuse vehicles um, to try and obviously uh, you know not have the impact on the street and, and we've managed by hook by crook um, due to the dedication of our own staff and that's a real selling point here you know using our own staff and not having contracts has made a real difference to us um, they've been incredibly Loyal and hardworking, um, you know, they come in when they've had time, time off to help us off. Um, they've volunteered um, to do the extra hours and things like that to keep the service going. So, you know, it, it's a real success story in one point. Um, in another point, to try and uh, deal with some of that impact, we've in introduced more training. So developing and growing our own drivers. So taking those that come in at a loader stage uh, and training them up. And we've had a number of successes with that. Uh, we obviously tie them to a couple of years um, staying with the authority, if not they have to pay back some of their training fees. So that, that's something that's worked reasonably well for us. Um, we're probably about, well, the last count, um, last day, um, we are three... Um, drivers short at this moment in time. That's not to say we haven't got them. Uh, we're using agency staff. Um, we were five, um, but we've got two more going through the recruitment process, and it's very much a moving feast uh, beast at the moment. Um, you know, I can ask for a couple of days. You know, anybody left? No, no. And then suddenly we get two leave in two days. So, yeah, it, it, it's a struggle. Um, we're recruiting non-stop and keeping that momentum going. Um, is it better? Possibly slightly, possibly slightly in the, in the sort of real doom of, of the sort of pandemic, um, but there's still a real challenge out there um, for that type of, of skill set and, and qualification as a driver. Um, so we are, like I said, we're, we're encouraging the loaders, we're encouraging other staff to take their qualifications to work with us on a training package to get them qualified and, and to retain them staff. Um, what is interesting as well is uh, we lost a few staff to um, there's an umbrella company that supports like the co-op and other um, food chains and stuff um, we lost a, f a few of our drivers we've actually seen a couple of them come back down 
um, simply because they thought the grass was green on the other side, there was more money. Um, however, they're now working throughout the weekends, they're doing longer hours during the day, and it doesn't fit in with their home life. So we have had a couple of them come back um, wishing to work for us because it suits their home life and they're willing to come back at a slightly uh, lower wage. So that's probably it on, on, on the driver's side. Um, across sort of the other areas as well, even operatives, um, I've never known a marketplace where we struggle to get basic staff, um, and that's loaders. You know, uh, you know that's uh, quite a, a low-skilled job. Um, throughout my career, I've never known a struggle to get uh, loaders. Um, but that's certainly the case over certainly the last three or four months. Um, whilst we have got them, um, and it hasn't affected the service, it is a real struggle to recruit even that level of staff now. And that, that's just generally across the industrial uh, workforce, really, at the moment in time. Matthew, I don't know if you want to add anything onto that. It, just to really uh, calibrate and validate Paul's points, for, for, for my side, be it our guys that um, obviously are out on the gully cleansing machines or obviously big I want to think about it already, but we are starting to head towards planning for our winter maintenance season. And again, the availability of those drivers, having the guys and girls that can go out and make sure the roads are nice and safe and uh, nice and clear, it is a consideration. It is a real challenge at the moment. As Paul says, we are we are sort of running to stand still in terms of recruitment. We have evergreen uh, uh, job adverts that are out there. We, we feel as we're constantly recruiting just to stand still at the moment because as soon as we can get guys and girls in, unfortunately, we are losing a few. I think as Paul said, it's stabilising slightly, but it's still, it still a very, very volatile market right across the priest resource market. And, yeah, HGV drivers being really, really felt acutely for us, as Paul said, we were, we were obviously, we work with a lot of our, our local bus operators. They were seeing that real pinch, and unfortunately, it was a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul. We were losing guys and girls to go off and drive buses, but as Paul said, a few have started to migrate back. So it's, I'm at pains to say it's stabilised, but yet we are seeing it, it, it level off slightly, but it is a, it's something we do have to look at on a daily basis rather than a weekly basis. But I, I, it is a real testament to, to, to everybody that, that we have had and we've got in, that we have kept... We have kept a lot of the uh, our, our, our proactive and reactive maintenance gangs out and about on our network. We have been able to get people to, to day centres and to other appointments they couldn't get to without our own sort of internal fleet. So it is a real testament to sort of the goodwill and as everybody has mucked in to make sure we can deliver those services that lots of our sort of residents uh, rely upon. So it's, it's something we'll keep our eye, eye on. But, yeah, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. It is something we're going to have to track on it. On a, on a daily basis. Just, just one other, well, a couple more points because you've actually got me to think about a couple other things. Is um, we've also been quite creative. Things like um, in deliveries where we've used them staff to prioritise the refuse collection, um, where we couldn't went for a period of time where we were really struggling to get HDV drivers. Um, we actually then recruited normal drivers, um, and actually through sitting down and working with the Matthews side from the VRD uh, area, actually deplated one of our larger vehicles to run on the 7.5 uh, payload so we could actually then use a normal uh, operative to actually still carry on delivering bins and stuff. Because at that time, this was a number of months ago, um, the shortage of 7.5 tonne vehicles in the, in the marketplace was actually significant um, because everybody else was struggling with drivers, so everybody tried to use smaller vehicles to keep their services going as well. So... Yeah, that, that's something we've done to keep the service going. Um, one of the other things, obviously, the demand for the service has still been there. And, in fact, things like glass collection um, has rocketed through the COVID. Everybody has seemed to have uh, taken and, and, and drunk more um, being at home. Probably people have not had to drive so much. They've taken advantage of that. So, you know, we've certainly seen nearly 50% rise, you know, nearly 1,000 extra tonnes of glass. You know, that, that is a lot. A thousand tons is a lot of bottles. Um, it is. It's a lot of wine. Um, so yeah, that that in itself um, has added impacts. You know, that's required extra collections for the bottle banks, extra resources in a time when the resources have been really short, and we've been prioritising trying to make sure that we we get them bins collected on a regular basis. So yeah, I, we just hope and pray that that we're over the worst now, um, and things will be a little bit easier um, 
because the staff and everybody involved, as Matthew says, it's been a real challenge over the last two, two and a bit years um, to keep everything going. So, Thank, thank you very much. I think um, as, as local councillors, I mean, we can a appreciate the difficulties there have been, but I think it's only right to say, um, to give uh, credit where credit is due as well, that... Um, that the, the departments have worked extremely hard and, and it's very obvious that lots of the um, um, uh, collection schemes, etc., have gone ahead as, as normal. I mean, I haven't seen any interruption into the normal domestic bin uh, pick-up at all. I mean, in fact, I've had mine taken today. You know, it's up, up, well, yeah, I mean... You can only speak as you find, can't you? And I haven't had any complaints as a ward councillor either of people being left and things. There are obviously people are um, complaining that bottles have not been cleared from bottle banks. And I would like to point out that not, it's not all alcohol that comes in glass containers. Um, and that, uh, you know, they could be full up with uh, pop bottles and jars of jam and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, let's, let's, not, let's, let's make out that all of our residents are alcoholics, you know, because the, the bottle banks are full. Um, but, you know, I, I think we have to be realistic about it. And certainly when you see a report like this, and incidentally, I should have said at the beginning that this, this um, item has come directly from the public consultations that we have to get onto our work programme. So it does show that you know, we are listening to what the public is saying out there and we are responding to the concerns that they have. So, and it's a very useful report. Um, and I'm not sure you know, what we can say about it other than thank you very much for all the good work that has been done. Um, and and we'll, you know, hopefully the normal service will be continued as soon as possible, so to speak. But in the circumstances, given that we've had a, a massive pandemic, um, the other authorities uh, had to um, you know, cease collections, bin collections, etc. We here in Bedford have been able to continue it. And it, it is the goodwill. And it's, not, it's, no, it's not just the officers. Obviously, they've got to organise it. But it, it's, it's the people on, on you know, the coal face, so to speak, or the bin face. Um, and it, and as, you, as you quite rightly pointed out, it is about the social services aspect of it and getting people to, um, to um, venues and things like that. So, I, it, you know, and, and, I, and I mean, yes, we have got the vacancies, but I think... When you look at the, you know, the number of vacancies is not massive, um, it, but it's just that we don't see, appear to have a supply of people coming in to, to, to take those vacancies up. But I think, you know, I would like to say, because I, as I said before, credit where credit's due, and there has been a lot of hard work done by a lot of people organising it and keeping it running. And so I'd like to say thank you very much. Are there are there any questions or comments from other members? Yes, Councillor Coombs. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I would endorse uh, the comments that you've just made about, about the service. Um, just reading this report, um, it is quite an apocalyptic picture that is being painted. It's only missing the music from Camina Burana playing in the background. You know, it's, 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 it's quite apocalyptic. I, I don't want to completely make light of it because um, it, it, they're very real issues that you... That you that you paint. Um, but I, my question was going to be, how many vacancies do we have? Because this suggests it's quite catastrophic. But I think, Paul, when you were speaking, you said three. And the three vacancies, whilst I know, I, as I say, I'm not making light of it, and it is a really real issue. Three issues doesn't sound like an awful lot in the great scheme of things, compared to the picture that we've got here. As the chair has mentioned, I haven't seen any issues with service reduction. Anyway, my bin day is tomorrow, Chair, so I'll, I'll let you know if, um, if, if everything's okay in Wixom's. Um, but yes, exactly as you say, Paul, it is like, you know, you may be peddling like, like mad below the surface, but out, out there, everything looks fine. So I just, I just want to sort of 
get the scale of it, really, and say, you know, how big an impact on the service does three vacancies have? Or, or am I missing it? Are, are, the, you know, are the problems bigger than that? Am I just being skimming on the surface? Uh, at the moment, um, we've got them uh, vacancies covered um, with agency staff. Um, the, the issue in the marketplace at the moment is where in the past we, we, we've interviewed staff and, and we've almost said, mm, no, not sure, let's have the next person's stuff. Um, we've had to take on because there isn't that luxury of interviewing person. If we get someone to come in, you know, if, if they've got the license and stuff, then, then we will take them. It's as simple as that. Um, to try and keep the surface going. So that in itself is not a great position to be in sometimes because that member of staff may only stay for a couple of days. We'll spend training and effort to do them. Um, they may not be reliable, hence, you know, they're in the marketplace still. Um, so, yeah, in, in, the, in the sort of height, um, like I said, you know, one of the things we mentioned in here is um, we're had the lucky uh, facility that the supervisory did have that qualification as well. And that, that's helped us considerably. Um, the downside of that when we sent the supervisory driver uh, driving the vehicles and stuff when we had a shortage of staff, um, then obviously the phones weren't getting answered, some of the, the, the requests and complaints weren't de getting dealt with so quickly. They were coming back at the end of the day trying to pick up in a day's work. Um, and no, you know, obviously things were getting missed, um, obviously bin deliveries um, during a period of the COVID slightly went out of performance and stuff. Um, obviously, from our point of view, it's not like someone in the office, if you haven't got a full complement, um, you know, if, if it's a white collar worker, then yes, you can be covered, they can be away. Unfortunately, with a refuse vehicle and a, and a loader, the team of three, uh, once one of them is missing, it has a, quite a catastrophic uh, you know, impact on that service, um, which often means, you know, if we go out with one load and a driver, then we, we then have to share the, the workload, the crew work longer, um, you know, especially in, in some of the temperatures we're going to see, you know, coming over the next week or two, um, it's a significant amount of stress to the team. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's not easy, um, and it puts a huge amount of stress on everybody else because, you know, we do try and work the workforce to all help each other out. It's not a case where once that round's finished and that driver and team go back, uh, we have a collective uh, finish. So we, we then send other people into them rounds um, to help everybody out. So if one round's going to be late or under pressure, then they're all going to work later um, to try and get the rounds to make sure we can collect all the bins at that night. Um, so, yeah, from that point of view, um, but, I, you know, tomorrow morning... Um, I could find out that three agency guys, two of them, haven't turned up. Um, and then we are then under severe pressure again. Um, and that's the issue using agency drivers. Um, that's not to say that some of our own staff could phone up tomorrow morning and say, unfortunately, I'm not coming in today because I'm poorly, whatever the case may be. Um, so it's, 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 a constant, it's a constant challenge. Uh, we never know until 6 o'clock in the morning what's going to happen. Um, and then we then racing around, like you say, with the, the ducks and the, the feet under the water, trying to make sure we can try and cover that surface and get that round out to make sure we can collect the bins in um, all the time. I think, yeah, Councillor Weir. Thank you, Chair. Just a comment, really, to support what Paul said. Um, having run many large transport businesses throughout my career, the biggest headache every morning was have we got enough bums on seats? Um, I let my Class 1 licence expire in 1986, so I don't think I'll be too... I mean, I could retrain, I suppose, if the money was good enough, but I, I, I do empathise, and I know that was the bane of everybody's life in, when you're uh, trying to get those people into cabs and get the, the vehicles out and moving. So, sympathies, but you're doing a great job. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, Councillor Atik. My mic is on, I'm just checking. Okay, my question is, you said like you promoted some of the people, trained them internally to the um, HGV driver. Have you tried this externally? Because I know this license, to get this license, is quite expensive to get the training. Have you advertised externally, try or 
a plan to try externally, give them training, get them, make them HGTV driver, and then give them condition to work them in a year with us if you get the license from us. So that might help the situation. We, we haven't yet, simply because um, we're concentrating on our own staff and want to give them the opportunities where we can. Um, it's something we've looked at. Um, we, you know, we've tried lots of different things to, to advertise, to try and uh, recruit. Um, and like I say, at one point, not that long ago, I think we were down to one vacancy. Um, but again, it's just, it's just so changing. Sometimes I dare not ask one of my managers, you know, I went for a habit of asking nearly every day, and every day it was completely different. And one day I was like, I'm not going to ask you no way. He goes, don't ask because we just lost three drivers today. I went, oh, my God. So, yeah, at the moment, like I say, um, three isn't, isn't a massive number. Um, you know, and, and what we tend to do, the two drivers that we're taking on at the moment, have, have, one's come through advert and one's come from an agency as well. Uh, which is good for us because obviously if they do come from an agency um, we, we can obviously trial them out first make sure um, they're competent even though they've got the, uh, the, the, you know, the qualifications and stuff um, trust me just because they've got that doesn't mean to say they can drive one of our types of vehicles um, and again you know, that, that is a real risk as Councillor Weir says you know, the bums on the seat first thing in the morning is, is just a start we need to make sure them bums are also uh, careful drivers, you know, we don't want people going out and racing around in our vehicles, um, having accidents, um, and, and, you know, portraying a council in a bad light, or even worse, you know, end up um, having an accident. So, you know, we, we've got to be really careful, we've got to be choosy in the current market, even though, like I said before, um, we, we do sort of take what we can, um, but again, they go through a skills analysis, um, we don't put them straight out onto, onto the street, there's, there's a, an element of training, an element of shadowing. We have to make sure that we're happy that that person, that driver, even though he's got the licence, um, is going to drive that vehicle safely, both from the public and obviously the crew with him. But yes, it is something, something we have considered at the moment. Uh, we, we are still running on the um, staff and some of the loaders that we've got and, and train them up through that uh, process. Any further questions or comments? No? Well, I'd just like to say thank you very much to both of you for the report. It's been very detailed, and I think, um, I hope you can take away with you the fact that we're very appreciative of everybody in the department, whatever their job is, that they've managed to um, hang on and, and keep going throughout some very difficult times, and it's not necessarily anybody's fault that we're in this situation and all we can do is to keep on trying, but, but, but well done to everybody for, for continuing in difficult circumstances. So thank you very much for both the reports. Thank you. Chair, Chair if I may, what, what I did last time, we, we brought something to do with the um, frontline services. I actually went back and we um, put a little poster where the um, debrief um, yeah. bay is at the depot, just to notify that they are appreciated and we do talk about them and pass on the committee's thanks if that's okay. Please, please do that. I would we'll be absolutely delighted if you could do that. And, and I'm very pleased that they came and emptied my bin on time today, both of them. Thank you. And Councillor Coombs is going to watch out for his tomorrow. <laughs> thank, you very much. But, but thank you very much. And that I, oh, there you are, you see. So we're talking from practical experience. Thank you, but please do that. Um, if we can then move back to the, to the agenda, um, we're now on to agenda item 8 at 7, to consider any call-ins. Are there um, any call-ins? Uh, there are no call-ins to consider, Chair. Thank you. So we're on now to um, 8, which is the executive, to consider the summary decisions made by the executive that fall within the remit of this committee. Um, not so many pieces of paper to keep turning over. Um, right, eight, so it's 8A. We're on page 8, uh, item agenda 8, 8A. And we're asked to um, look if we want to look at any of the items on the agenda here. Um, sorry? 
that yeah, one of them we've done today anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, we're happy that we note it. Um, Chair, I thought you had some suggestions about the rail strategy and the growth plan. The, uh, y y what? Put into the work programme? Um, there was a suggestion that the rail strategy be added to the right work programme in conjunction with the item in January, I think it is, that's already in the work plan to do with East West Rail. And then that the growth plan evaluation gets added to the work programme. I believe it's in March, where there's already a, the local plan's already in the work programme. Yeah, and sorry, I, I, I missed that because I'm looking on different pages. Um, are, you, are you happy with that, uh, yeah. Councillor Sampson? Um, we'll kind of integrate them in at the appropriate time, yes? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy, for that. Then we move then to agenda item B, which is to look at the executive decisions that are listed for, for the fu any future agenda. A couple of them are actually confidential. Is there anybody that wants to talk to any of these ones on here? We're making a lot of neighbourhood plans. You should, you know, it's all there. Any, anybody want to raise anything to put it onto uh, future agendas? No? Okay. Sorry, Sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, I think we should just note them and, and, and also to say that um, the officer did pass on the confidential information which allowed us to view and, and determine whether they needed to be questions or decisions scrutinised, but everything yeah, seems yeah, fine. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I didn't want to sort of go over the whole lot here. I mean, everybody's got it, everybody would have read it and, and we would receive the confidential information. So you're happy, you're happy with them, with the... We just continue with our work program we've got because the next item is the work program anyway. Yeah. Okay. We're okay with that. Um, so we then move on to item ten, which is the, the work program. Any comments on on the work program? Next meeting is uh, plans for attracting new businesses to the town centre. That should take all night. And the highway works in minimising disruption. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be quite a lot of anecdotal stuff there too. Okay, everybody happy with the work programme? As it is at the moment. I mean, obviously, sometimes a bit of a moving feast, but the less movement there is, the better it is. Okay. Well, that concludes the meeting for tonight. Thank you very much for your attendance. and. I hope the sun's still shining and there's a little bit of time left to enjoy it. Thank you very much, everybody.